I wanna be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I wanna be a producer. Greetings, listeners. This is Ken Davenport. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast, where every week I get to sit down and talk with a Broadway mover and shaker, and this week is certainly no exception. I'm lucky enough to be across the table from and sitting with the Executive Director of the Theater Development Fund, or TDF, Victoria Tory Bailey. Welcome, Tory. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I bet money that just about every single one of you listening to this podcast right now has seen a show thanks to TDF and the work that Tori does. You see, if you didn't know, they're the ones that run the TKTS booth. I won the bet, didn't I? But that's only one little piece of what TDF does, from providing inexpensive costume rentals to nonprofit theaters around the country to providing access to theater for people with disabilities. What they do stretches so far beyond selling tickets for half price. So that's where I want to start, Tori. Tell me a little bit about the mission of TDF. TDF was founded in the belief that the performing arts are essential to one's life experience and that you really, in order to, to, to lead a full life, people need to have exposure to theater and to dance. And our founders believed that and they were worried about it sounds funny now because once every five or ten years, people are worried about the future of the American play. Um, but they were worried about the future of the American play, and they were trying to figure out how best to sustain the arts. And they, it, with this belief that the arts are really important, and, and I stick a pin in that because we'll circle back to that in terms of things going forward. Um, and they decided the way to do that, the best way to do that was to build audiences. And so from the very beginning, we have been a service organization that's been about audiences, and that's what sets us apart from almost any other performing arts service organization or trade association because you have Art New York which works with off-Broadway theaters and off-off-Broadway theaters, they're their members. The Broadway League, the producers, the theater owners, they're the members. Our members are audience members and so we really exist to fulfill the belief that people should go to the theater and to remove a whole host of different kinds of barriers whether it's economic, whether it's accessibility, whether it's kids who are in school and don't know anything about the theater because there's less and less arts and education that's actually bringing kids to the theater, whether it's less and less people in the country know about theater altogether, right? We've reached a point where, you know, if you go back and look at it in the 50s, Arthur Miller was on the cover of Life magazine, right? Playwrights were on the covers of magazines. There are studies now where you ask people to name a playwright and they can't name a playwright. A few people will come up with Neil Simon. If you ask them to come up with a living playwright, Shakespeare resonates a little bit. You know, attendance at the theater overall in this country, which the National Endowment for the Arts measures every four years, continues to decline. So we're about making sure that people who want to go to the theater and something gets in their way can go. We're about helping people learn about theater who don't know that it's there or don't think it's for them or they're scared of it, but they think, you know, you have to dress up and it's fancy and you have to be, have, you know, a postgraduate degree or whatever to appreciate going to the theater. We're about creating appetite and trying to get people in the door. And once we get them there, we're about trying to sustain them there. So that's the thread through all of the programs. We, it manifests itself in different ways, but everything we do is rooted in this belief that people should be able to go to theater and go to dance. That's what we do. And when was it founded? TDF was founded in 19, either 1967 or 1968. The papers were filed in 67 and they were incorporated in 68. And the very first program at TDF was the program that has become our membership program. So the first program, what the founders did was they originally, their theory was they would buy tickets from shows that were opening that were in previews that they thought were meritorious. They would buy tickets and they would give them to people who could not afford them. So tickets at that point were like eight or nine dollars full price tickets and so they would buy them for five dollars. There was a play selector committee of one that was Harold Clerman and if Clerman decided, right, they would That's buy a good guy it was a good guy place. to have to do it. <laughs> they would buy the tickets and then they would give them to teachers or retirees or diverse audiences way back at the beginning. And they figured out really early on that was not going to be sustainable because they were going to keep raising money to buy tickets. To them. So they said, okay, Mr. Producer, if we approve you, will you make tickets available to us at $5 in previews, which we will then sell to the members, which is the beginning of the membership program as it exists today. And we now have over 100,000 members 
primarily in the tri-state area, but we have members in every state of the union except, I think it's Montana. There's one place we don't reach. Okay, um, Montana. We, okay, people. Montana. Sign yeah. up. Pretty, it might be Utah. It's one of those two. Um, but we have we have a hundred thousand members, and you're a producer. You understand that shows productions can choose to make available tickets to TDF. You know, generally it's in previews. Sometimes at the it's at the end of the run. A weekend like we've just had the Fourth of July. I always say that holiday weekends are you know TDF members are a producers' gift because our members are you know middle class folks, modest means, and they don't tend to go away on a holiday weekend. And we can actually fill seats for people because they're here and it's a holiday. But the idea is, you know, we have 100,000 members, and as you know, to qualify to be a member, it's a bunch of things which are a way of saying you're not, you know, you're not rich, you don't have enough money to pay full price. And those tickets, you know, an off-off-Broadway ticket is $5, and, you know, the most a member pays, the ticket price for a Broadway musical is 40 And that was the first program. The second program was the booth, and the booth was 1972, and you know how it is. If a show is hugely successful, it was 12 million different people's idea, and the booth was many people's idea. Um, I like to say that the, I wasn't there, so I, you know, the key players, Anna Krauss was TDF's board chair at that point. The city was very involved. The Schubert organization was very involved because people, the, the theater owners were worried about their real estate, right? It was the nadir of Times Square. They were very, people weren't coming. People were going to the theater. Tourists weren't coming to Times Square. Do you know about Gray's Drugstore? You must. No? I don't. Okay, so in the 30s, there was a drugstore, I think, in Times Square, and there was a line drawing of this on our the booth's 40th anniversary recently, so you can go back and find it. There's a drugstore in Times Square called Gray's Drugstore, and at half hour, the guy who ran the soda fountain, treasurers would bring him tickets, and he was, people knew they could come and get a half-price ticket. So the model goes all the way back, right? Nothing is ever new, right? And so between the theater owners, TDF, the city, the idea was if you put a legitimate... See what would happen if you put legitimate business in Times Square selling day of discount tickets. And the idea was it was an experiment at the beginning. Duffy Square is a park, New York City Park, so that's how it ended up on Duffy. Phil Smith and Ken Patton, who was on our board, and Anna went to Central Park. There was an extra, and the Parks Commissioner, there was an empty trailer, and they said you can have the trailer for the summer, and they brought the trailer down to Duffy. And, it, you know, that's how the booth started. And we were exceedingly lucky because, you know, not-for-profit organizations, it's unusual to have two key programs at the beginning that are on mission because both of them were. I mean, the booth was totally, the idea of making affordable tickets available to folks was completely what we were about. At the same time that it was really helping shows when they needed it because you don't have to commit ahead of time, Right. Um, both the membership program and the booth were on mission, and they generated enough net revenue to, down the line, be able to then create programs that were not going to generate revenue, but were going to be absolutely outwardly service-driven. And the first one of those programs, the next thing that came along was the access program. And we started with um, providing sign interpreting and then open captioning as well. And, we, you know, it's expanded and grown since then. The latest initiative there is our autism-friendly performances for kids on the spectrum and their families. Quite powerful and exciting, and there's a lot of stuff that's really it's fabulous to watch what happens as families come back, because they're actually we are really building theater goals. Then our education program started in the 90s, and then there's the costume collection, which is very much a part of TDF and totally... It is somewhat mission tangential, right? I mean, one of the things, in, I like to say that in the 70s, you know, as the regional theater movement was exploding, service organizations did whatever they could to be useful, and the Metropolitan Opera was retiring a bunch of productions, and they gave the costumes to the New York State Council on the Arts, and NISCA opened a warehouse upstate somewhere where those prisoners were, right? The recently escaped prisoners, and um, nobody came to rent costumes because, of course, they had to drive upstate, so they said, okay, we better move to the city, and the idea was to make them available to nonprofits, and they came to TDF, and they said, would you like to run it, and they said, sure. So we ended up with a costume collection, which is now about 90,000 clothes. We have a warehouse in Astoria. The thing that's wonderful about the costume collection, 
among many things, is we rent to not-for-profits around the country, as well as commercial folks, different rate, but commercial folks when they need it. But, you know, some kid in wherever is, you know, doing a musical or doing amateur opera, and Beverly Sills' name is in the dress. It's about sparking passion. Anyway, that's what we do. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a lot. I think that's what was interesting about TDF is so many people associated with the and, booth. And it's a huge... I mean, look, we say... If if they could have if they'd known then in 1972 what the booth was going to become, we would have called it TDF and not let any but not worried about why. But you know, so you have I mean, for marketing speak, right? Huge double brand problem. You know, the, the TKTS brand is obviously really strong, and the TDF brand has its own, and we wrestle with this. And as you know, one of the things that we deal with as an organization that's continuing to grow and is now much more focused on audience development, building audiences. There's no revenue generation in building audiences, and certainly not for us, because you know, one of the great misperceptions about the booth, lots of people think that we keep part of the ticket price. Of course, we don't. You get the ticket price. We have the service charge, but there are people who think, no, no, you get part of the ticket, too, and we don't. And so the programs that we're doing now and starting on now, which are audience development programs, we have to raise money to do that. And in order to hit more kids, we have to get to more schools and be involved in more schools. We have to raise more money. And in order to raise more money, we are, there's a lot of internal conversation now about how do you reconcile TKTS, TDF, and how do you explain who we are in a way that makes sense to someone maybe two sentences longer than the elevator speech. It can't be much more than two sentences long. Has there ever been a conversation about renaming the TKTS booth the TDF booth? That one doesn't come up as often as people say, what about putting TKTS in the mother name? My charge right now is that we get the sentences right. And I think if we can get the sentences right, then we'll have some further inkling about how to deal with the name. And one of the things, I mean, I get, we get scripts periodically because people assume from our name that we produce. So I occasionally, I'll pass them on if you would like, I occasionally get scripts from people who... Only if they're great. Right, well, <laughs> you should read them. Um, but this idea of development is actually, I think, coming back into my mind because what we're doing is, in fact, developing audiences. And, you know, when I started in the theater, I worked in, I worked exclusive, well, pretty much exclusively in the not-for-profit. You know, when I started in the theater, theaters had audience development directors, and somewhere along the line, they stopped having audience development directors and they started having marketing directors. And I think the underlying supposition was that there were plenty of people to go. We just had to get them to go to, they had to come to my show before they went to your show. So I had to market my brand of my theater. And we lost the idea that we actually have to develop audiences. And, you know, one of the things that, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I certainly hear this a lot in conversation around the city. One of the things that I think is going on right now is I'm, wor I'm worried about the New York audience on Broadway. You know, I'm worried about are the New Yorkers getting there in the strength and in the numbers that we need them. Because after all, that's part of why you live in New York, right? So why, are you gonna, why would you put up with exploding manhole covers if you can't also go to the theater? And so how are we getting those people in the theater? And, and that's the kind of development work that we need to be doing now. So this idea the name, it may well be that at the end we are developing. There is that, that I don't know if that makes sense, but that, that development piece is central. It makes perfect sense, and I've, I've certainly noticed from being an outside observer the shift in focus on developing audiences in your reign there as the executive director, which I will also tell you, you are such you are synonymous, so synonymous with TDF. It feels like you were a founder, frankly. Um, from the first time I heard you speak about it. And the fact is, you weren't a founder. And you haven't even been there that long. I've been there about 14 years now. Yeah. It doesn't seem... I like to say I'm really lucky because I always knew I wanted to work in the theater. I started hanging around in theaters when I was like 12 years old. I lived in, lived in Washington, D.C. Then we moved to Minneapolis when I was 16. And I, I worked... I was at the Children's Theater Company school in Minneapolis. When there was a school there, I went to regular school in the morning and performing school in the afternoon. Um, I applied for several conservatory programs, and they were smart enough to not take me because um, I wasn't good enough. And so I did. I kept doing extracurricular theater through college, and I stage managed. And I figured out when I was graduating that I didn't really 
I loved stage managing, but the part of stage managing that I liked the most was in the rehearsal hall and through opening. And then I realized that the way you actually made a living was figuring out the show that was going to keep you working after opening. And I thought, well, this, this is not going to make me happy because that part's boring. Right? Which, I mean, obviously it's not. There's a whole other skill set, but it wasn't the one that was interesting to me. And so um, my first job was actually in New York working for a now deceased a service organization called the Foundation for the Extension and Development of the American Professional Theater, or FADAT, which was run by Fred Vogel. And they, FADAT provided technical assistance for emerging not-for-profits around the country. It was a fabulous first job because the consultants were all the leading folks working in the sector, so I got to meet them all while I answered the phone. Um, and then after that, I sold tickets at the OREP for two years, so I ran the box office up there. And I always say, you have to work in the box office. You have to know who those people And so lucky, and then in my first job, I got to meet a bunch of people. Lucky that in my second job, I got thrown and had the audience in my face every night, all the time, and realized that it's actually about the people who come. And then I went to the Manhattan Theater Club where I stayed for 19 years. So I had a whole producing life, which was rich and fulfilling and hard and all of the things that it is. And then I knew I wanted to do something different. I didn't really know what it was. And I knew I wanted to stay in New York. And I knew one of the things about doing nonprofit in New York is, as you know, there's you, you move back and forth, right? So, you know, I general managed Love Valor. I mean, I, we did, I'd done a lot of stuff. And then I, you know, ended up at the service organization. And so now I get to think about things and I get to think about bigger issues. And I never thought, I'd, I thought I would miss producing way too much to be there. I never imagined being there more than five years. I just thought this would be an interesting thing to do. And then I got there and I realized, A, how much the place did. B, I got there in the spring of 2001, so right about when I figured, okay, you know about how six months into a gig you think, I think I know what this is now, and, you know, that was Labor Day weekend of 2001, so right after that was the, you know, September 11th. So that year had a whole different flavor than it might otherwise, and then we built the booth, and that, you know, that was its own thing for, and then when that's done, then you think, okay, so now it really is about what should TDF be doing moving forward. And, and, and at the same time, I think there are huge shifts going on, not only in the, in the institutional sector, you know, on the nonprofit side, I think we've got some very big issues. Um, I think the commercial sector, I think there's some big things we have to think about. And so I feel kind of less that I actually get paid to think about some of these things. You know, I, I remember I'd been at TDF about a year and I realized that if I wanted to read something, I could do that. <laughs> I was supposed to do that, right? I was actually supposed to read what people were saying in writing. You know, I mean, when I was at MTC, we did nine shows a year. It wasn't a lot of reading time unless it was a script. And I think what you just said is why I'm so thankful we have institutions like TDF and people like you there because I actually, my job, of course I'm going to do this for the rest of my life and produce lots of shows. So I always have a long-term goal, if you will, or mission statement. But at the same time, when I produce a show, it's, it's that a, show. It's only that, that show. show. Yeah. That's it. No, and, and we do a lot of stuff in theaters, right? I could not do this job in a service organization where I didn't get to be in the theater and where I didn't know that we were making, you know, we're a part of the, we're a big part of the economic picture. And so we're making a difference, but I don't have to worry anymore about the tech on Tuesday and the final, you know, in stage one and the final dress here and the closing performance here and the auditions for, no. And, and I mean, look, one of the differences between what you do as a commercial producer and what a not-for-profit producer does is, you know, you there are playwrights who you can talk about all the care and feeding and relationship building in the world in the kind of institutional sector. But when a commercial producer is producing your play, they're not thinking about anything else. And when you're working in a large institutional theater, they are thinking about something else. They've got five other ones to think about. And it's a very different kind of focus. And we did a study on, um, the economics of new plays, and, and uh, Todd London, who was running the dramas, was the wrote it and directed the study, and it was very interesting in conversation with producers about, you know, the difference between talking to commercial producers and talking to some of the not-for-profit producers about their relationships with their writers, 
And I mean, it didn't surprise me because I've been on both sides of the fence, but Todd was deeply moved by the extent to which the commercial producers really care about the projects. They, you know, and I always say to people when someone will say to me, I don't understand, how could anyone have thought that was a good idea? And I go, you don't understand. When you produce something, you think it's a good idea in the commercial sector. In the not-for-profit sector, the producing choices are so different. I have a relationship with this writer that I need to sustain, right? I mean, you don't have that. You do it because you want to do it. And at that moment in time, you're sure it's the best thing you ever did. And then you close that, and then you love the next child just as much, right? Always just a little bit more. Always a little bit but more. You're so right, and I've learned that about the nonprofit. I've seen many a nonprofit play and wondered, why the heck are they doing this right now? And then in talking to people like you and learning, it's about so oh, many other things. There was we, one season at MTC. It nearly killed us um, internally, but you know, it's just a string of shows that met their mark. I try really hard to use words like succeeded, met what their potential, as opposed to hits and flops, because I don't think that way as much. And I remember somebody said, God, Lynn was really lucky. And I said, no, look at the list of writers and let's talk about the history with these writers. We're lucky that it all happened to come home to bear fruit this year. But there isn't anything new. And that's always, of course, the tricky part. Not just a lot of institutional theaters get stuff lobbed at them because it's like, well, why do they always work with the same people? Well, you know, that's a really hard one to call because you have relationships and you're building on relationships. And, you know, why, why, why does Theater X not have new designers? And what, well, when you hire a director, don't you let them talk to you about who they want to work with? Right? And no one ever says, why does a commercial producer use this team over and over? And, and so, you know, the question is, where's the place where the new people get a chance? But then, you know, when you look at last spring, this past spring on Broadway, you know, I would challenge any institutional theater anywhere in the country to have come up with what we managed to come up with on Broadway last spring. One of the things I've been so impressed by is how quickly the booth has changed over the last decade or so while you've been there. Accepting credit cards, the play line, lots of innovation, of course, the, the redesign of the booth itself. Anything else planned for the future? The thing about the booth is that I think you have to figure out moving forward, what's the booth's place? Where are we in the ecosystem? Because we're not the only place to get a discount ticket anymore, right? When the booth started, we were the only place to get a discount ticket. The last time we looked at it, over 30% of the people online were going to their first Broadway show. You know, we are the place that encourages people to ask questions, makes it safe to go. And I think part of the future of the booth as we think about it is how do you engage, how do you educate people? I so wanted to be able, I was talking to someone about this earlier today, put screens further down on the plaza. They wouldn't let us, I mean, that's not our property, right? And, but to find ways to use technology to make that experience, not just buying a ticket, but reinforcing the learning and, you know, how do we get all those people sitting on the steps, many of whom have no idea you can buy a ticket there to buy a ticket, right? How do, you t how do we use that as a development tool, which is different than most of the rest of the marketing, whether it's any, you know, you're forced when you're doing, you know this, who do you, who do you mail to first? Musical multi-buyers. Multi-buyers, right? You mail the people who've gone before. So who's the... And you have to, right? I mean, it's kind of career-ending as a general manager to say, I have an idea that's really interesting. Why don't we try, right? I used to say, if someone would just give us a million dollars to try a bunch of stuff so it could fail, that's what I'm supposed to do for you, right? What TDF is supposed to do for you guys is try things, see if they work. If they work... Good going, right? So it's what are the things that we should be saying to people who don't go to the theater or who have never been to a play? The future is a lot about building on the brand and the gathering place to actually expand the audience. Yeah, I love this idea that you, you're you supposed to experiment for us. I think that is, thank God you're there to do that. <laughs> And now, as crazy as it may sound, I would love to hear an ex I only hear about your successes in a way. Well, we start, here's a failure, and we're, we're working, we're trying to revamp it. Um, 
here's a challenge. We got funding three or four years back from, you know, the subdistrict council money, but we got subdistrict council funding to create a program that was kind of marrying our the structure of our education programs and our education program stage doors, the kids there are eight classroom sessions around going to the theater, four before, four after, teaching artist goes into the school, works with the teacher, links the whole activity to the curriculum because you have to do that because if it's not linked to the common core curriculum, they're not going to give you the time, right? And then they go and, and so we thought, okay, what if you, we were moving to a population of adults? And so it was a year when I was looking at the league statistics the percentage of New Yorkers from outer boroughs who come to Broadway is very, very low, right? And the outer borough folks who come to Broadway, you and I can guess. It tends to be Park Slope, it tends to be Brooklyn Heights, right? I mean, it's neighborhoods that mirror Manhattan neighborhoods. And that's not just economics. That's about am I welcome? That's about do I think about it? That's, it's a whole host of things. And so we created a program working with groups with tickets at like $50, $55, and they would have a pre-performance meeting, the group would, and they'd have to commit to a pre-performance, and then they'd go to the theater and a post-performance and reflection. And we had 20 or 30 groups the first year, and the whole idea was they had to be able to pay at least $50 for a ticket, because if they couldn't pay that, it wasn't sustainable. And so, you know, as it took five, 600 people, went to, everybody went to two shows, and you know what? By the second, and the idea was we'd do it two or three years, and it didn't work. Now we've morphed it into now our director of education and engagement, who's been with us two or three years now, when Daniel came in and said, this isn't working, Tori. And I loved that program. And it was a really long time. It was like a good year before I finally went, you're right, it's not working. Um, and now the pilot we're doing next year is we, you know, we've identified... Not like a group, like a sorority group, or you know, these were more kind of. We're working with the Harlem Dream Center, which is an all part of First Corinthian Baptist. We're working with the Harlem Dream Center pilot program, like twenty adults. We're getting rid of the part where we bring in the teaching artist. Nobody's got that kind of time. We're working with a community leader and a teaching artist, crafting a different kind of conversation based in the community coming to Broadway, but also going to theater in their community, also going to see something else in the city, and see if that works, and we've got, we're going to build it as a pilot over three years, and maybe in the second year add a group. It's structured differently, smaller, but if this, this could be a different way of engaging people. I and mean, one of the other realities is, what are we going to do about how much it costs to go to the theater? So that's a huge, I mean, for us, you know, I mean, for our programs, even at the booth, I know that in general folks don't, you guys don't like to hear this, but people walk away. There's a price point. There is a price point. And we think it's about, for most of the booth's customers, I think it's about $100. You say to a family of four visiting from wherever, it's going to be $375 for the four of them to go to the theater. It doesn't cost that where they come from. It doesn't cost a third of that where they come from. Thank God we take credit cards. But that's so, as we create these programs, one of those challenges is how do we create programs that continue to keep Broadway important because I think everybody in the city ought to think they can go to Broadway. But we have to also find other things, other places. I don't want going to the theater to be a bucket list item, something you do on a birthday that ends in a five or a zero. So we've done some research. People think Broadway, we did some stuff about five years ago, about barriers to attendance. and. One of the questions was, do you think that Broadway is too expensive? And people were like, no. And I'm like, mm. and then they go, well, what, and why do you go to Broadway for a special event? So, who, it, so it's fine if you're going to do it on your 60th birthday. But if you want people to actually go to the theater four or five times a year, which is what you want, right? You, they're not going to, they can't. And I don't know how we figure that out. You obviously work and talk to a lot of producers throughout the course of a year. Name your favorites. No, I'm just kidding. I won't. <laughs> Name your least favorites. You can't do um, that. This is TDF. We love everyone equally. <laughs> I'll turn the mic off, then you can tell me. Uh, no, but what does the, for the modern day producer, the ones that you do admire the most, that you think really get it, short term and long term, what are the characteristics that they have? Well, look, you're talking to me, so the. It's the truth of the matter is that first and foremost, they are producers who 
have an appetite for it, a nose for it, an understanding of real artistry. I mean, it's producers who are doing work. It doesn't have to be cutting edge. I think that this, the art form allows us an opportunity to tell stories that can serve any variety of purposes, all of which are valid. Right? Sometimes, in the worst of times, the most important thing is to be entertained. But we can tell stories. I admire the people the most who have a piece that they want to produce because they love the artists involved, they love the story, they understand the power of the story in ways that other people may not necessarily see. And not just because this vehicle landed in my lap with this actor, all of that stuff still doesn't guarantee a good experience. And what I worry about is the people who spend, the person who goes to the booth and doesn't buy the tickets because they were too expensive, when they come to New York the next time, I think they go to Baltimore. I don't think they come to the booth because they've just decided not to do that. The person who spends $400 on a premium ticket and goes, oh, that, that was all, right? That's not helping us either. It's producers who are open to new ideas and open to just but the main thing is you got to love the work you got to love the work and it's got to there's got to be some external logic that says i'm doing this because what's your favorite show you've seen over the last several years you got a, something that stands out there isn't anyone i mean it, and i'm not being coy i i just i i think we all go to the theater for so many different reasons i'm interested in shows that are trying to find a way inject an awareness of technology into kind of linear storytelling. So I think some of that is interesting. I mean, you know, look this year, I, I mean, look at the past season. I mean, there I, it was a stuff that was wonderful. I mean, incredibly moving for us was bringing kids to Hamilton, the public, incredibly moving. Um, on a thousand levels, there's an interview in the journal today with one of the actors about what it was to do that show when they were watching the audience and the audience looked like we kind of we had high school kids who never understood until they went that the founding fathers were immigrants. Okay, so that's one kind of story, right? That's one kind of story. And then there's, I mean, you know, uh, I can say all I want about new plays and things people believe in, and then you sit and look at the King and I, and I've never heard that the way I heard. I mean, it's it's, it's not fair to ask me. But like, <laughs> Uh, TDF in 20 years, where do you see it going or where do you see it, how, how it influences Broadway? I really hope that what we're able to do is continue to develop programs that, make sh that, that ensure conversation and audiences. I mean, my fantasy is, and, and so it's, it's what's the programmatic equivalent of, you know, a brownstone somewhere around here in the West 50s or the four, you know, where anyone who goes to the theater anywhere in New York knows that they could go there at 10 o'clock and have a coffee or a glass of wine or whatever and that there'll be other people there who went and saw it who were also theater goers or dance goers that night and they just talk about it and then they, right? It's, it's the, how do we keep, how do we put this in the conversation? There is something essential about what we're creating when we create going to the theater, but we are all of us, you, me, all of us, doing a really bad job of communicating what that is to people who don't go. People who go get it, and they come back. But people who don't go, you know, you have to go at a certain... I mean, all of the things that contemporary society represents in terms of how we get our entertainment, we're the opposite of that. I don't think we should change that. I think we have to embrace that. There's a whole bunch of people who say, you know, as the most, some of the best futurist work is actually done by the American Museum Association. They do this report every year on like five trends. And one of them was, what's the importance of public spaces as people's houses and apartments get smaller and smaller? What, 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 are, what, so what should our theaters be? Can we open our doors at 4 o'clock in the afternoon? 2 o'clock in the afternoon? You know, why we're doing a whole project on playwrights and putting playwrights and theaters and audiences in more direct conversation. And one of the things that came up at a convening was, you know, why do all our subscription offices work 10 to 6? You should work them into 8. And then you could put them in the lobby, and you wouldn't even have to pay for someone to work. And then the lobby doors would be open, right? God, that's such a simple fix. But th those are the kind <laughs> So what do I hope we're doing? I hope we're surfacing and unpacking and demonstrating some of that stuff so that, because I know how hard, we know how hard what you do is. What you do is virtually impossible. 
right? It's close to impossible what you do. Our job is to worry about that stuff and think about that stuff and is to, to continue to be in conversation enough to know what's important for us to be looking at because it doesn't do any good for TDF to live in a bubble and say, well, we think this is important. No. What's important is what can we do to help you because that's what we do. We're all in this together and we all have our different pieces to do and I think it's helpful when we are seen as more than just people selling tickets that a lot of producers wish they could be selling at full price. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, well, what do you think about shows that don't come to the booth? And I, my answer to that is really simple. Any show that closes without coming to the booth was either a limited engagement with a superstar and they didn't need us or they didn't do their job very well. Right? And that's, so that, so that's, the, but that, I, I use that as a metaphor for we're in it together. Okay, last question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes down to your office and knocks on your door and thanks you profusely for the development of new audiences and all the work you've done and for keeping Aladdin off the booth. They'll get there. <laughs> they will. I'm sure they <laughs> and will. And they've been great partners on our... We've done an autism-friendly performance, so... I want you to imagine that the genie says to you, I want to thank you and give you one wish. I'm going to give you a wish to change anything about the Broadway theater scene that you'd like. The one thing that drives you crazy, that keeps you up at night, that makes you so angry you just can't stop talking about it. What is the one thing that you'd ask this genie to change? This is going to sound... I would love for the Broadway community to feel secure enough in its long-term viability to be more generous in the short run, whether that's a certain number of seats at a consistent price point in good seats every night, whether that's putting students in the production in the run consistently throughout, whether it's allowing producers to, sh to bolster each other up better. But something that says it's safe to be generous for the long-term well-being. I think that's a great answer. Take a little bit of a hit today for the future of our business, for sure. Yeah, and and under, and it's and not even a hit. Just I mean, here's the best example. It's the whole multi-buyer idea. If you can create a fund to cover a strike, which you had to do, create a fund so that every tenth ticket someone buys in a period of time is free and it gets paid for by the fund. Now that is an idea. Uh, Tori. Charlotte had multi-buyer on the list very early on. Remember? I mean, it's like. I love that though. We always, we prepare for disaster. Like really when, well. For those really. of you who don't know what Tori's talking about is there, you know, the Broadway League. We have a reserve fund for strikes that of course we have to have in case something goes down so we can pay for legal and we can give distribute to the shows. But the world, not only Broadway, the world seems to prepare for disaster. Very well for disaster. And we do so little that says, let's invest in a belief that we're going to still be here tomorrow. Because of course we are. As challenging as our industry is, we're going to be here for a very long time. We've survived the radio, the television. We'll survive the internet. We'll be around. We will. Thank Tori, you. Thank you so much for doing this. Everyone out there, uh, please join me in thanking Tori. You know, TDF is not just a part of the Broadway machine. It is part of the foundation of Broadway itself. Sure, without the TKTS booths, shows wouldn't, would have a lot of dead seats, but more importantly, without TDF and all of its initiatives, so many young people and people who couldn't afford it wouldn't be able to experience Broadway. Tori and TDF, they're helping to develop the audience of the future. We're so thankful for it. Uh, thanks again for being here. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. If you're one of those people that says theater is too expensive, check out TDF. They have a way for you to get in. Tune in next time. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.